What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Einstein Bagels, RX Bars, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. You know, what I love uh, saying about the stories is it's interesting to hear the story of Noah Alper, who created and sold his chain of bagel stores to Einstein's for over $100 million. But what I really love is, and what we don't realize, is before that, he was selling religious tchotchkes out of his trunk that did horribly, did not do well at all, and was a horrible business. And he had several failures before he created Noah's Bagels, which he sold. So I love to hear some of the background of that. Um, and we'll, we'll, I'm going to introduce you to the guest in a second. Um, the episode today is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. And Rise25's mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Um, we do that in three ways. One, we have a done-for-you media and content marketing. Um, so basically, we our company will completely run and launch your own podcast, distribute it across 11 different channels, do a dedicated blog post, social media. It's a complete content marketing strategy. Um, you basically simply show up and talk. We do everything else. Um, you know, our team has been working with podcasters since 2009. I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. Besides meeting all those founders I mentioned in the beginning, I've made best friends, found my business partner, and it's obviously led to a lot of relationships with countless customers and referral partners. Um, so if you are not doing a podcast, you should definitely consider doing one. Um, the second thing we have a done for you lead generation where we basically manual, manually send out a consistent flow of customized outreach messages. And this is not uh, paid traffic, by the way. And we'll find out some amazing traffic sources and what uh, SAN does, actually, um, because they're not your typical uh, paid Facebook ads. Uh, we also have a done for you VIP event where we will partner with software companies and conferences and bring their highest level customers in a room to network. Um, I have to mention this Sticker Mule um, is a sponsor, but they, I only have them sponsored because they have this, this amazing deal. First of all, they have a great company, it's one of the easiest and fastest ways to buy custom printed products. Um, you can basically upload your image. In 60 seconds, you can turn into custom stickers, magnets, buttons. They work with Amazon, Nike, Google. And say, you may be like this. They gave me this deal and they said, if it goes viral, they're going to shut it off. So it's not going to be available. But they said um, 10 custom stickers for $1. Um, and that pro this doesn't even cover shipping. Um, so if you go to stickermule.com slash inspired, then you can get 10 custom stickers for your company, put them on your laptop or whatever uh, for $1, uh, stickermule.com slash inspired. They do it probably because they know you're going to order a bunch more once you get yeah, hooked. Exactly. But um, <laughs> today's guest, um, I had the pleasure. He was so nice and he, uh, we were at Brian Kurtz's Mastermind and he drove me to the airport and we had um, an amazing discussion about marketing, direct response marketing, um, all of the offline channels that... Um, he is a, you know, an expert at, and um, so I'm appreciative for that, and he's going to shed some wisdom on all these topics today. San Sarkar is a serial entrepreneur. He's a founder of the health supplement brand Invigorate Now Health Sciences. He's also the creator of Sark Media Direct, and what they do there is it's a direct marketing consultancy that specializes in helping entrepreneurs grow to seven figures and beyond in the health and e-commerce space, and also they also help consulting agencies as well. Um, he helps combine the cutting edge online marketing strategies, but with the traditional direct response marketing. And he's helped his clients scale to eight figures and beyond. He's worked with some of the biggest names in the industry, including Martha Stewart, Organifi, Zenith Labs, and many more. And he has a knack. I'm in the car ride and we talked, I'm like, we have to get on the line and you have to you know, share your wisdom because when you look online, there's nothing. Like He just is in the trenches. He has his nose down and he's doing it. So he's not out there really teaching it um, or talking about it. So I, I had to nab him and I want to thank Esther Kiss also for making sure we reconnected and, and got this done. 
Um, but he has a knack for finding the low hanging fruit in his clients' businesses with um, newspapers, newspaper ads. Um, have you heard of newspapers? People actually still do read them um, and they still do work. Uh, radio ads, affiliate marketing and direct mail. And, um, you know, in particular, he helped a small division of a company grow from 27, you know, to $27 million in just two years. And now it's doing over $55 million. And we throw these big numbers around, but, you know, he's, he really doesn't talk about it that much, you know. So I'm excited to talk. You know, there is a page that I studied that he put out that you have to go to because there's so much wisdom in it. If you go to sarkmediadirect.com slash the number eight dash figures, um, that will give you – he's actually um, – it's, you know, hidden. Probably no one – not many people know about it, but it is golden. And he talks about the six steps that – basically scaled an e-com business from 25000 to $1.4 million per month. So, Sam, that was a long way of saying thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, man. Awesome to be here. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's been great meeting you and chatting with you. So looking forward to uh, talking more today. So, um, you know, I know you talk about, in general, behind closed doors, people don't know how to sell correctly offline, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and there's... A piece that you talk about, a star story solution. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, so in a nutshell, um, I think people don't realize this, but all, I mean, some of the biggest, most successful ads of all time, they're all based around one popular, well, not necessarily popular, one star, right? So it could be it could be you, it could be me, um, or it could be Martha Stewart. It could be anybody, right? But it has to be somebody who's seen as the hero um, and somebody that the reader um, or viewer can relate to. Uh, and then it's a story that's built around that person that in most cases you're tying in the star and a story with a big problem. Uh, you're then agitating that problem. So let's say you're trying to lose weight, right? So we find this new cause for weight loss uh, or for, for your weight problems. We make it worse, right? So you have to agitate the problem all around what the star has discovered. Mm -hmm. And that really weaves the story together. And finally, you present a solution. So this star goes through the story and then finds a solution to that major problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it in a nutshell, right? The star, the story behind that star, and the solution that that star discovered. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, look, this isn't new. Like, this, is, this has been around for, for ages. I, I mean, as you Movies know, Movies sure, follow these, these type yeah. of formats and everything else. Yeah, the story arcs. I, and, I mean, guys like Gary Halbert, Dan Kennedy, they all talk about this kind of stuff. It's all old school, all school <clears throat> old school direct response marketing that still works so well today, but that most entrepreneurs just don't follow. And, you know, it can be massive if you just pay attention to it and do it in your copy um, and your sales messaging. So how did you discover this? Who were you learning from or who did you, how did you oh, stumble man. across this? So, so many. Uh, so I, I started a business about eight years ago now. Um, and my first, my first year was terrible. Like, so I, I always love telling the story because it's like, I think people think it's easy, and like even some clients that work, I work with now, like they'll have one bad ad run, and they'll think it's like over, and like they should quit. And I'm like, my first year in business, I made forty five dollars. Like it's pathetic, but it's true, right? It's like some. What, were, what did that look so, like for you? What were you doing at the time? What? Yeah, so well, well, I just clarify. So I had a yeah. few like small business ideas here and there that didn't really work out. But my first real business, which was uh, my first supplement company, so I made a product, and, and this was the biggest mistake of all, right? I made a product first, and I thought, let me just throw a ton of ingredients into this product and then sell this, like, everything pill, right? No one wants an everything pill, right? Mm -hmm. People want people have a big problem, whatever, whether it's weight loss or blood sugar or joint pain. They have a problem, and they want a direct solution to that problem. They don't want 75 ingredients, you know, Um but I didn't know that. What right? so were I, you? T what was that product? What type of product was it? Was it like a multivitamin, or what was? Uh, it was a mix. It was like there was a green tea, there was turmeric, there was ginger, there was a lot of different stuff. And and like my whole thing was look like, uh, turmeric does this, green tea does this, uh, ginger does this, and like what ended up happening is that we were trying to sell everything, right? And like uh, again, no one wants that. Um, and so that basically failed so hard. And like and also like me kind of. I think trying to play business but not really knowing what I was doing, I, I would go out like I like I paid people for, for PR and copy and all this stuff, which you should do 
if you know what you're doing. Right. I didn't know what I was doing, so I hired some random person for PR, some random copywriter, and I just wasted and blew through money, like 20, 30K of my own money the first year. Mm. And I didn't make a sale until one year in, and that sale was $45. Wow. It was like really, really bad. And obviously after that, I had to learn. I was forced to learn, right? I was like, I either learn now or I give up. So I dove into marketing books. I think I, think I started with Dan Kennedy's Magnetic Marketing Program. It was like 500 it's a bucks. classic, yeah. Yeah, it, it, and at that time, I was like, oh my God, $500, like, oh my God, right? Of course, no, knowing what I know now, that's nothing, right? Like, I spent so much more on coaches and, and consulting and so, uh, so on and so forth, but it's all led to massive breakthroughs in my yeah. business, so. Um, Sam, I want to go back to that first yeah. $45 sale for a second. Um, that, the mic is hitting your collar a little bit and creating some feedback, oh. so, um, yeah, just, yeah, exactly. But, um, so, you... So you burn through twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars, and a lot of stuff didn't work. What, what then started to work for you at that time? Yeah, so it, it really turned into me learning how to write my own copy. That was step one, like learning how to well, learning how to see what somebody wanted and learning how to write copy around those desires, right? Like not trying to force a product down someone's throat. Uh, throat, but finding out what exactly do they want and how can I kind of fine tune my messaging towards that. Um, and that came from, you know, Dan Kennedy, and then I kind of dove into uh, Gary Halbert and Ben Suarez and all these old school direct response copywriters and marketers um, who've been doing this for 20, 30 years, right? And I had to learn how to really write copy. Um, and when I did that, I turned things around. I had a long form sales letter. It was like a 4,000 word sales letter selling my supplement. Um, I, I repositioned things, I changed the ingredients around a bit, and I made it just for weight loss. Mm. Um, and then That's I had a big mark, pain point. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. And also, so kind of going back a bit further, it's kind of from my story. The reason I started the product in the first place was because I lost uh, about 75 pounds. Oh, my God. Yeah, so I used diet, exercise, and also supplements. I, I had probably tried 50 different supplements, all kinds of herbs, ingredients, etc., um, and I stumbled onto a few that worked. So turmeric was one of them, ginger, green tea. So the ones I had in my product from the beginning, but yeah. I didn't know how to sell it. So this time around, I learned how to sell it. Um, and I created this long form copy. And then I step two was finding out how to get traffic, right? So um, I joined a mastermind at that time, which was run by uh, Craig Ballantyne and Vedros Koulian. Um, I've had so these guys, both of them on the podcast. Yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, so those guys are awesome. At, uh, you know, as I'm sure you know, and uh, they basically like, and people don't notice, but Craig Ballantyne and, and Bedros, they're behind some of the biggest health marketers online today. Um, you know, myself included, right? So like, they're behind all these guys with with ebook followings and supplement companies, um, and so they really taught me how to um, not only you know refine my copy and messaging more, but how to get traffic, how to meet affiliate partners. Um, how to do these deals, join ventures, all these kinds of things. Um, so that was step two, right? So I had a copy done, and then I found out how to get really traffic to that product. Um, I met these affiliates in person. I made deals with them. We we became friends, you know. And like as you were saying in the beginning, like what I love about business is like it's not just like making a deal. It's like you become friends with people, you meet them, and like you connect on a deeper level. Totally. Um, and that's that's so huge, you know. So I mean, even in in when I mentioned that that link. Um, the sorkmediadirect.com slash eight dash figures. Um, you have, when you go to that page, it takes it will take you to another page um, of some of the you know the six steps to help scale, etc. But you talk about this, which I think just one sentence in that is golden. Just one of them is talking about just partnering up and um, having people do an insert. Right? Exactly. I mean, that yeah. is, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that later, but it's sort of um, what you're talking about with you just team up with um, other businesses. The question is, how do you find the right fit of the business? You know, because I imagine, especially in the supplement space, you know, people have a wide range of supplements. So what is your criteria for, okay, maybe they have a competing one, maybe they don't, uh, maybe they have a complementary one. How much overlap does there have to be or not be for you to partner up with them or maybe it doesn't matter at all for you yeah no no it definitely matters so um yeah i mean there are a lot of guys we work with today but it really comes down to what is their buyer base made up of so like for example 
if it's my own products or a client products that we're helping to promote, we have to see what the product is and where that matches with the affiliate partners, right? So there are some partners who have big lists of weight loss buyers or joint pain buyers or diabetes buyers. So like we have to kind of match things together um, because in most cases, I, I mean, there are some cases where one product will work to almost every list, but in most cases, that's not true. In most cases, yeah. you really have to match your offer to the list. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's really playing around with each offer on an individual basis and seeing what that offer is and what the best match is for that. Um, and then getting those deals in place. And, you know, talk about some of the things you, if you can or can't, you know, you did a lot of different mediums for Martha Stewart. Yeah. Um, what are some of the offline strategies that you use that worked? Uh, so the best ones were newspapers, radio, and direct mail. Um, TV was good too. Um, and like, you know, we spent quite a bit on it, but it wasn't like a massive, massive thing for us. Um, but it's funny because like when I first told them we can do um, uh, newspapers for them, like, oh my God, that conversation. But I, and look, I, I mean, I'm sure it's the same with anybody who hears me right now saying this, like everyone thinks the Seems papers ridiculous. are dead, but yeah. they're not, right? Not at all. Um, so yeah, newspapers turn into Which a for you, it's probably cost. better that you, yeah, just saying, yeah, it's totally dead. And then you can have more newspaper space for yourself. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's funny. That's part of the reason why it works so well to this day, um, because the last ten years, so much has shifted online. Um, and so what happens is when we go in to buy these uh, newspapers, or, or, or basically buy an ad in a certain day, um, a lot of times, or almost all the time, we can get very, very big deals, like eighty-five percent off the rate card, ninety percent off the rate card, because. It's not to say no one's advertising there, but a lot of the traffic has shifted. So these publishers and the papers, they don't have um, all these advertisers. Not in demand. They have, yeah, they have inventory left over, and they can sell that discount, um, which is basically more money for you. So what are some of the things? So you go to them, you convince them, you know, let's do this newspaper thing. It works. You know, they're a little skeptical. The radio, TV. TV, maybe they're not as skeptical because probably Martha Stewart's been on different shopping networks and things but yeah. from the newspaper specifically what have you found um is big mistake that maybe you thought would work you know um what hasn't oh, worked yeah. in the newspaper and then what are some things that that have worked yeah so this this is great and like i kind of hope martha doesn't see this because it would make her feel bad but um uh so we tell we split tested um, an ad. One of that one ad had her image, her face on it, and one did not. Hmm. Um, and so her image and face worked great in the Northeast states, so like New York, Pennsylvania, you know, Jersey, etc. In the South, her face bombed. So hmm. the same. So the copy was exactly the same. Hmm. Same headline, same sub headline, same copy, um, but an image of our warehouse, which basically was talking about, you know, high demand and sales and whatnot. <laughs> That image killed it in the South, uh, and her face just no one bought from it. So mm. it's it, it. Well, first of all, I mean that's a lesson in itself of testing, right? Like you would have to test these things on a very you know granular basis. You can't just go out and just expect it to work overnight. You know, we test the headlines, sub headlines, images. Um, but yeah, so th that's funny, right? Like you would you would assume uh, Martha Stewart, like her face will work everywhere. Not true. So in the Northeast, <laughs> um, how many ads are you testing? Like, how many so, ads do you go out with and then do you test against? Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with about 15 papers. So it'll be one ad in 15 papers, another ad in 15 more papers, um, and those are tested against each other. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll you go start head to head. Basis. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but we'll start national, so we won't start regional. Regional filtering is like when you're on a very high level and you're looking very granularly at, okay, what happens in this region, this region, this region. Um, but in the beginning, it's all it's a national, you know, 15 papers across the country just to understand, okay, what does the broad American population respond to? Yeah. So you found the image. Um, it wasn't really a mistake. It was just you're testing things, right? Yeah. Um, what else did you find with your testing that was interesting? Um, Are there anything with the offers that you've tested that were yes, interesting? Yes, good question. Yeah, yeah. So... Uh, well, well. So this, I kind of, kind of knew and and figure will be the case, but um, but Martha and her team did not. So they basically, we have to test saying, 
um, you can get thirty dollars dollars off. So basically, testing these kind of offers um, within the copy. And for me, it was like, no, like we have to test um, some kind of offer which has the word free in it. Yeah. So it's you know free you know free bonus meals, free bonus whatever. Um, and they're like, oh no, we had to test like twenty five dollars off, thirty dollars off. I'm like, all right, fine. So we tested them all, and I mean, as expected, the the free one just crushed it. The twenty five off one and thirty thirty dollar off one did nothing. Like they were really bad ads. Mm. And again, that's funny, right? It's the same exact copy, just the last you know hundred words of the close were changed to give a different offer, um, and then one ad killed it, and one just bombed. So. Mm. And so you want free in there. So what do you advocate someone, let's say they're going out, and this could apply to online too, right? Not just offline, oh, yeah. but is it a free because they're buy one, get one free? Or is it a free, just a free smaller version they can upgrade? How do you, how, what have you seen is, are some good offers as far as using the word free? Yes, yeah, so it definitely cannot be like a free trial or free whatever, because my philosophy, especially when you're buying, buying media, you want to have some at least break even if not profit on day one and if you're doing a free trial you can't really do that um so we all i mean we'll say free but we'll clarify in the copy free bonus something right so if it's free bonus bottle like if it's a supplement we'll say you know call now for two free bonus bottles mm. so they're seeing free they're getting all pumped up because it says free in there but we're clarifying it's a bonus bottle so what happens when they call in is they'll have to buy two to get two free Mm. Um, and, and so they're spending, you know, 138, 140 for that order. Um, and that gives, gives us a pretty high order value, which helps us offset the cost of the ads on day one. Yeah. So. What have you seen as far as, again, like, do you send people to specific, um, channels on radio or newspaper or is it the same channel? Are you, do you want to send them to a call or, uh, online? Where do you recommend sending them? Yeah, so it's different per channel. Um, for so for print, for every single person we've done it for, even myself, it's all been call center, except for Martha. So they didn't want to do a call center, uh, so we ran theirs to a URL. Hmm. Um, for radio, we actually do text message call to actions. Hmm. Um, so basically, you'll say, "Oh, like text text X keyword to you know three 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 four four four." They'll text that and then get a text message that's automated with like. Um, an image and then a link to the offer and then they'll go online and buy mm. um, and TV's TV's going to a landing page um, and direct mail is going to a URL also for for Martha stuff but for uh, toll free numbers for everything else do you find that in the newspaper does text call to action work or no we haven't tried it you haven't? Okay. Um, I wouldn't because it's the older demographics up I, I mean my assumption yeah is yeah yeah really want to text so. I'm just picturing everyone on radio like crashing because they're like <laughs> driving and then they're texting like, yeah text. you know, we ha- yeah we had that fear we really did but but it worked fine and like as far as far as we know there are no that's practices. the only thing they have <laughs> access to really i mean they they're not gonna like write down a url or yeah. you know unfortunately people are texting and driving all the time um yeah. so also on that page you talk about a big mistake people make which is back end back-end direct mail mm-hmm. campaigns. Um, and I think you say, you know, you have an automated sequence that is a year long. Yeah. <laughs> a year long. Yeah. It's fun. It's very profitable. Um, and no one does it, so I'll do it. <laughs> you know? Like, this is direct mail, though, right? Direct mail, yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, well, like, you're I, putting, I mean, for all everyone listening, you're putting something in the mail, postage. I mean, there's a lot of costs. You're not yeah. having, I mean, some people I know, Say, you know, they they say, well, they're talking about an email campaign that is hard for them to execute on yeah. for a year, which is, f- I mean, it's not free, but it's essentially free to send yeah. the email. And you're talking about a year long direct mail campaign. Yeah. So, and I think it's funny you said that that's the hardest challenge. The hardest challenge is a mental challenge where people think, oh my God, like I can't pay 80 cents for this, you know, per person. Like I can't do mail. I mean, if you think that way, then fine. But like, (laughs) I mean, it's your loss because there are companies, um, myself included, um, many of my clients included, who are doing this and making a lot of money. And if you look also at the kind of these old school direct response companies, they were built on print and direct mail. And if you opt into any of them, like for example, um, I'm sure you you know Agora, 
So if you hop into any Agora companies, um, you know, any of their supplement stuff, you'll get direct mail for like four years. Like I still get direct mail today from like one one offer I bought to you know to learn what they're doing three four years ago. Um, so yeah, uh, it's huge. You have to do it in my opinion, um, but no one wants to do it. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I mean, I do break down what to do, at least for the first steps in that article. But um, in a nutshell, what I would say is like, at the bare minimum, if you're selling any kind of product, you know, just put an insert inside of your package. Um, so let's say you're selling um, a joint pain supplement, right? So you put uh, a five by seven insert, basically like a postcard si- postcard sized insert in your package and offer, you know, buy two, get th- two free of our brand new joint pain cream. Um, so this is, you know, the art of the whole cross-selling, upselling, where somebody already is hot, they bought a supplement, they want relief from their problem, so give them more of what they want, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so yeah, I, at the bare minimum, minimum do inserts. Um, after that, I would do postcards to them and stick letters to really reaffirm their purchase um, and make them buy more. But um, I know most people won't do that, so I'll say at the bare minimum, just at least put an insert yeah. in your box. So. Now, when you're doing the automated, you know, the year-long sequence, are you segmenting? Um, I know because you talk about taking your best buyers. Are yeah. you segmenting those out, or are they included into the the year-long sequence? And they're just getting different things. So all the ones who come in as new customers, they get into the automated sequence no matter what. Yeah. Um, but we we also do kind of these uh, these one-off mailers, and those we tend to do mostly our best buyers, the the top you know one to two thousand who spent a lot of money with us. Uh, and that's another qu- uh, that's another thing which I'm sure, of course, you know, but maybe your re- your listeners might not is like your your highest value customers. They like you, they trust you, they want more from you. Right. And pe- people neglect them for some reason, you know. Um, is there a frequency so yeah. re- you recommend that you do? Like once a month, you'll run a report to do that, or how <laughs> far frequent do you recommend sending stuff to them? Yeah, so, so it it depends on, on your tolerance. I mean, the best ideal is once a month, but if you even do once every three months, kind of like a uh, like a spring, summer, fall mailer mm-hmm. kind of thing, mm-hmm. that works fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as you're doing it and and again, caring about them because yeah. look, they already bought from you. You already have them on your list. There's no reason to, to um, not to say waste, but people spend so much time on acquiring new totally. customers when they already have these people who are, you know, there's no more cost to acquire them. So, so yeah. what's some crazy, interesting things you've sent to those customers? Anything out of the um, ordinary? Well, for for Martha stuff, yeah. So so for most of the other stuff, not so much. It's mostly postcards, mailers, um, offers. But for Martha stuff, um, <laughs> like there there there's one package that there's spoons in it, so actual wooden spoons. Um, there's another one with, with like we basically send like uh, dessert samples, so we'll have some samples of cookies from like top companies. Mm. Um, so basically, like it's more like treats and gifts in a sense um, versus just offers you know um and that one really helps along with with uh with your attention because if you give them these little free knickknacks here and there maybe it costs you a dollar two dollars but they spend another 50 100 bucks with you it's, it's obviously worth it you know yeah so um yeah talk about what's your take on amazon obviously amazon's hot um yeah and what is your take on selling on amazon so we <sighs> I haven't done a whole lot myself on Amazon. I mean, we have like pages up there, but like we don't do any ads there or anything. People do a lot of Amazon, but I also know people, um, like close friends of mine who have done seven figures a month on Amazon and then got shut down. So Amazon- Very my, risky. Yeah, so my, my thing on Amazon, and, and again, I'm not like that experienced in Amazon, so maybe my opinion isn't yeah. that worthwhile, but I will say that I prefer to own my assets and know that this is my website, these are my ads, this is my whatever. I'm not kind of borrowing time on someone else's platform, which yeah. you are with Amazon. Yeah. When you bring on, you know, obviously you do this for yourself and your own company, but you also have a, like, a lot of clients that you do this for, right? Um, with yeah. Sark Media Direct. Um, what What's the process look like? They come to you and are you doing an inventory of their assets? What's like some typical advice or you know, that they're getting when you onboard them? 
Yeah, so, so I mean, the biggest thing, first of all, it, I have to understand that they're really in this, like, in it to win it, because I, I think one thing that people think is, like, oh, I'll just, like, hire, uh, you know, a coach or agency, and, like, all my problems will go away. And, like, yeah, maybe that's true to an extent, but, like, I really need to know that these people are in this for the long term, because there is work involved yeah. to build a seven-figure company, and, like, I mean, look, we, you know, we run ads for this stuff, so we get a lot of that applications. You know, we must, we deny at least a quarter of them off the bat um, just before we even talk to them. Um, they're more to come on a phone with us that are not a fit at all, and we, you know, basically deny them also because the reality is, like, if you have money, that's awesome. But if you, you know, if you don't really have um, the, uh, like, like, like the, the, the mental power and, and our willpower to really stick to your business and follow these teachings and do the process the way we do it, we, we, we don't know you'll succeed. So we don't right. want you, you know? Um, what are some big mistakes yeah. that you see these companies making when they're coming to you? That well, the you, biggest, you know, you're good at identifying the kind of that low hanging fruit. Yeah. What are they not yeah. doing? The biggest one is the average order values. Um, I mean, there's probably like three people I've spoken to in the last two years who have average order value in health supplements above 200. But every funnel we do is above 200. Um, people have order values of like 25 bucks and 75 bucks and, and so on and so forth. And like, it's very hard to scale a business with those numbers. Um, so the, like, w and this is kind of going back to the previous topic. It's like, I have to make sure people are willing to go in and revamp their entire funnel, you know, mm -hmm. redo their copy, redo every step of the funnel. And like, people don't want to do that. You know, they just want to pay somebody and, and, and have magic happen. And that's not how it works. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we basically, we show them our exact, our exact funnel, we show them all the upsells, the cross sells, the down sells, everything in place to make sure that um, when traffic goes to that funnel, not only does the copy convert, but they get a ton of orders and back end orders. Um, and ideally, you know, if their average ticket is 200, 220, they can pay, whether it's cold media buys or affiliates, they can pay out a hundred bucks right. per sale, still walk away with 120 in gross margin. Um, and then their net profit on that is you know thirty five percent or so, which is pretty good for supplements. So, so going from that order value of whatever thirty dollars to two hundred dollars, what are some of the pieces that you see that people are missing? Is it they're just charging too little? Is it they're just not bundling things together? What are what are things yeah. that people are not doing? It it's a mix of everything. So some people have, so some people their copy doesn't really talk to the fact of you need to order more bottles. Um, so their copy isn't really messaged properly. Um, a lot of them are charging way too little. They're charging 20 bucks per bottle. Um, a lot of them are not, are not doing bundling. They're just doing one bottle. Or they're doing auto ship. And auto ship is good, but auto ship, it takes you, you know, five months to make back what we make in one day. You know, so uh, people, a lot of people do auto ship because they've seen someone else doing it. So they're, they're doing auto ship else. for like one bottle type of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah like Instead one of them buying 40 bucks a month. four bottles off the bat, they do an auto ship and it's maybe one bottle. Yeah. yeah. So, so it takes them four months to even make what we make, you know, today. Um, so there's that. And then you have people who um, maybe their pricing is okay, but they don't have order bumps. They don't have upsells. They don't have downsells. Um, they have all these kind of fundamentals that that most marketers or, or that most high level marketers know, but that most kind of newer people do not know. Yeah. So. And you mentioned, Sam, in the beginning about I had a question written down, and it's a bad question, by the way. And you made me realize that when, what you said in the beginning, which is like I want to hear kind of your process and your thought process on product selection. Um, but really, what you you said in the beginning is it's not about product selection; it's more about you look at specific pains. That people yes. are experiencing. Cool. So, how do you decide which of the pains that you're going to go after and solve, as opposed to others? And then, obviously, your product comes from there. Yeah. So, so we actually have this, you know, these kind of full-on trainings and process in week one. So people who join us in the first week, they're basically looking at all the options in the market, um, and they're doing this really in-depth research um, on what else is selling in that market and how much is is being sold. Right. So, like, base, we're helping them identify not a product, but what other, uh, what markets are there and what's the kind of demand in that market. Um, and then one thing I say, um, which is huge to me, but I think a lot of people don't realize it is like, you have to have some kind of passion for that market. Um, and like 
that doesn't mean you have to have diabetes or joint pain, but maybe, you know, maybe somebody you know has it or whatever. But like I found that doing this for you know eight years now, like there are times when it's gonna be three a.m. and like you're figuring out some some issue on your page or whatever, and it sucks and you hate it all and like you want to give up, and if you don't have that passion, you will give up. Um, so I say whatever market you choose, first make sure there's high demand for it. Make sure there's other products that are really selling to solve that problem, and then make sure that it's something that you will care about. Um, you know, when stuff hits the fan, um, and no one else there except you. So, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, because I know you help health ecom companies, but you also help, you know, agencies scale. Um, but as far as the that piece, before we talk about the uh, agencies, what's an idea? I'm just curious because I know you have a lot of ideas and you would execute on a lot, but a lot you can't. What's an amazing yeah. idea that you have that you will not execute on that would be interesting for someone to think about? Um, it could be in the health space. It could be in the supplement space. It could be in general. Yeah, you know, I think one thing which, I mean, I still kind of want to do, but, but I probably shouldn't is, um, so, uh, a lot of the ads that we've bought um, for radio, they're called per inquiry ads. So basically we're paying for a call or a lead. Um, and in a sense, my, my ideas look like if we know that from the people we buy from, we can, you know, we can pay them $10 or, or $12 per lead, um, I can basically start an extension of my agency which charges you know our clients twenty bucks it's per like lead. It's like an arbitrage but, type of thing. Yeah, but but we manage the entire process for them. All they do is give us the ads. We do everything else. Yeah. Um, and and we collect that eight dollar spread in lead. Um, but you may start like, doing if someone listens to this right now and then goes, "I want you to do that for me." Then this just yeah, may right. turn into a business. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. So and so that like to me it was huge because I know how to get that um, how to get those that is huge video very cheap. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so, and so there's an the opportunity there. But Who wouldn't do that we'll see. with you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a paper, you know, a paper lead or paper exactly. performance. Yeah, um, yeah, because basically it's like it's like the affiliate networks online but offline. So, I think I was talking about this concept in this um, sort of similar with Don Houtman. Yeah, oh, that what, was awesome. So yeah. tell me about you went and hung out with Don. What stuff did you learn from him? You know, he's just yeah, so, old school. If you haven't checked out the interview I did with Don, it's amazing. You know, uh, he has tons of ads. He's written speak Spanish like a diplomat and, and ones that have generated a lot of, of revenue. Um, yeah. What did you learn from Don? Yeah, yeah. So, so a ton, but that's one of the biggest ones, right? Because like I love the idea of like what is it that makes certain ads tick? Ads that go on to make millions, right? Um and, you know, I forget exactly what he said, but he, he tried two versions of that, of that headline. One version was like, okay, I think one version was like, oh, like you can speak Spanish like a diplomat. And one was just speak Spanish like, like a diplomat. And that one version was like 10 times better yeah. and went on to scale and make millions of dollars. Um, and like, that's so huge. Did he like, say he, why? Why do you think that is? Just taking out those two words in the beginning. I don't, I, I, he told me, I honestly I have a bad memory. So yeah. like, I don't remember. But, but, um. But but yeah, so we discussed that length about that and other ads he's done, and like, um, it just reminds me so much how like so small things in your copy can have such a huge huge difference. Like one headline, in this case, you know, two words in a headline um, can turn around a campaign, and like that that kind of goes back to like people don't test enough, people don't they don't try enough, they just give up, you know. Um, so yeah, like learning from him is just like, look, this guy has done this for so long, it's been so successful. And it's like it all came down to just testing and tweaking and refining, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, agencies. Um, yeah. What are some, what's some advice you give agencies that you've helped to scale? Because again, like in a maybe it's a service based business, it's it's different, a little bit different, same concept, but a little bit different. Like okay, you have like a thousand bottles or a thousand widgets to ship them out. Um, it's I don't know if it's easier to to meet demand, but I guess the cognitive piece of me wants to think it is so how do you what do you what advice do you give to agencies for scaling 
Yeah, so, well, there are two things, right? One is basically their strategy. There's so many agencies who, I, I mean, look, like I do post on my page, on my Facebook page too, but there's so many who are so scared to do paid ads. And it's like, look, like the, the, the ROI and paid, paid ads is ridiculous. I mean, there's a certain way to do it. Like all you have to do essentially, the way I do it too, is we run ads, um, we run them to longer content pieces, whether it's a video or an article in my case, um, and then we have calls booked and then we talk with them and we basically, you know, we pick the ones that are fit for the program and bring them in. Um, and on the back end, there has to be a pretty high ticket, right? So like a lot of agencies, they they sell their soul, you know, for, for nothing. And it's like, look, like if you have a great service, you have to be willing to charge that fee for it. Um, and like, look, I, I made the same mistake too. Like, you know, I there are some clients that I, I took on a while ago who, you know, who I charged you know, 12K to build the entire business for them was ridiculous, you know, like, um, so, so basically like you have to really understand a, that A to Z process of building a paid ads funnel that can scale, right? So not one that's based just on your organic reach, but really the ability to buy traffic and, and turn $1 into 10 or, or five or whatever it is. Um, and then be able to charge enough to really justify the value that you give to them. Because if you can add, you know, six figures plus to their business, you, you should be charging eight or 10K. You know, I mean, it's a no brainer because they'll make 10 times their money back. So, um, yeah, what's so your, those, what's your those philosophy are the on charging? And then, because I know some people just have a flat rate and some people have a flat rate plus a performance percentage yeah. of that. What's your philosophy on that? So, for done for you stuff, we have a uh, commission also. Mm-hmm. So, basically, we'll, I, mean, I mean, we don't charge a ton, but it'll be around. Four percent or so commission in most cases. So you um, so become like kind of front. partners with them in a sense. Yeah, as they yeah, grow, I, you grow. Exactly. Yeah, and, and this kind of goes back to you know if you're a, a direct response copywriter, um, most likely you're being paid royalties, right? And it's it's similar to that, right? Because like we're doing the copy for them, we're doing the funnel for them, we're helping them get traffic. So like we you know we we charge the fee plus commission on sales. Um, and then for our coaching clients, essentially we'll do upfront fees or we'll do monthly programs. Um, and the reason I've shifted towards monthly kind of ongoing retainers because, you know, we have or, or we had these kind of 10 week programs and they're great. But the reality is like People it takes about 10 support. weeks. To, yeah, yeah it, it takes 10 weeks to get things off the ground and then you need support after that. So um We've been doing these longer, longer term agreements too. Mm-hmm. So. so I want to talk a little bit about the, you know, you, you have these six steps, right? That help scale the e-com business from 25,000 a month to 1.4 million per month. Who doesn't want that? Um, you know, that was $25,000 total. I oh, probably should say oh, wow. 25, not even total. per month. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Even more <laughs> impressive. Um, and so I want to go through, you have a couple in, I, again, Go to you know circmediadirect.com slash eight dash figures. You can feed the whole story, but I just want to kind of talk about some of the key pieces that I saw because um, there's there's di- six different growth laws. Um, there's you know it's kind of broken up into newspaper ads, radio ads, um, and I'm looking here at the um, newspaper ad piece, and one of the biggest things you talk about is um, advertorial obviously um are there certain things in newspaper um that again like right now just would have someone get over a big mistake that you made early on um a big mistake i made early on you know yes a big mistake i made early on is that i just wrote what i thought would work I didn't like look at ads that work in the past. I didn't like try to figure out their structure. It's like a rope where I thought it would work. And that's dumb. <laughs> that doesn't work. What does work is, is, is studying copy that's killed over, over the years, right? Studying great, great ads, handwriting those ads, breaking down their structures, understanding, okay, this is how they started. This is how they transitioned. This is, this is you know, step three, step four, step five. Understanding how they do it and then modeling your ads off that. Um, not copying, but modeling, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so now, like you know, obviously we've done this for a while now, so we have a lot of ads that we've written that work. So now we just model our ads based on our old ads, right? So it's it's basically a no brainer to make it work because 
you're shortcutting that process so much. Um, but yeah, so when I first started though, I was writing like, oh, like this sounds good. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put this over here and try this on. And that, you know, that's that's foolish. So. And then would you take yeah. you know in the next one you talk about radio ads? You use a similar structure in the radio ads as you do in the newspaper. Um, not really. No. So well, 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 to clarify, I mean, we do use a lot of the same. We use the same hooks. So if we find one major hook that works in the papers. We'll then start out with that one in the radio, but because it's so condensed, it's usually a minute long. Um, it's hard to do that exact kind of flow that we do in papers. Um, but similarly, we'll look at other radio ads that we've done in the past and that have worked for other companies, and we'll model our structure based off that. So it's always really modeling success um, and not trying to reinvent the wheel. You yeah. Know? And in several of the you know the growth laws, you talk about partnerships are key. Um, can you talk about an interesting reciprocal swap that you had? Yeah. Um, so this company, which sadly they're now defunct, but, uh, but they're called green blender. So they, what they would do is like, they would like, they would send you a box of like your, you know, all the fruits and vegetables and stuff to make smoothies. Um, and so we did swaps with them for forever. And, and what's amazing is what swaps is, um, you don't pay any kind of media spend. All you do is you pay the cost of postage um, to have, or, or sorry, you pay the cost of production to have the yeah. inserts produced, and then the postage to send send the insert to the other company, yeah. and they put Which in the box. Which is minimal. Yeah, it's, it's like nothing, right? So I mean, we were getting like thirty dollars CPAs. So the, our cost per acquisition was thirty bucks uh, for a new customer, and the customer spent like three fifty with us. Wow. So it was like a ten x ROI. Um, and Green Blender was one of the best, and the reason why is because it was so similar. Because the product that was for Martha stuff, the product we were selling um, for Martha stuff was like it, it was like a food kit, right? So it was a similar concept. So it wasn't the exact same type of product, but it was the same buyer, right? The same type of buyer who they want stuff sent to them, and then they want to put put it together themselves. They want to cook themselves or make it themselves. They just don't have the time to do the hard work of like going to the store and planning recipes and whatnot. So, um, yeah, and that's that's a huge tip, right? So finding where your where your type of buyer is and selling more to that buyer type, you know, because people are different, right? Me and you, we we buy stuff differently, we do stuff differently. Um, so companies have to understand and kind of know who their buyer is and cater to them. Mm-hmm. Now, talk about structuring the deal. Do you then, because I imagine not everyone's on equal footing, not everyone has the same number of subscribers or, you know, whatever it is. Do you say, well, we'll, you, we'll send you 10,000 inserts and you ten, send us 10,000 inserts. How do you, what are some of the different creative ways you've been able to structure deals with companies? Yeah, so it's, it's almost always been a match. So, I mean, if they can only send 5,000, then we'll send 5,000. Um, if they can send, you know, five hundred thousand, we can only send a hundred thousand. We'll send for them five times, you know. So we try to make it equal um, because when it's equal, then you basically you get customers from them, they get customers from you, and that's that. Um, yeah, actually, I mean, we haven't really, I haven't really done anything offline that was lopsided. Online, we do more ones that are more lopsided. So with with affiliates, we'll do, you know. We might have one person who's smaller send only once or twice, but the bigger one sends a lot more, um, and that's because a lot of times for for some of the affiliates we work with, you know, um, if an offer works for their list, they they want to promote it again, and it's not necessarily about you know, oh, you have to send the same number of clicks for me, you know? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. How do you find those like that the green one? So. A lot of them was cold, was cold outreach, um, so a lot of LinkedIn stuff, reaching out to them. Um, but also, I mean, you kind of get it through your network in a sense. So um, not Green Blender, but there were a few others who um, who were introduced to some introduced by someone on Martha's team. Um, so people, you know, ask around maybe like, you know, for example, like if you were to ask me, oh, do you know somebody in, in the health space who can promote whatever? I'd be like, yeah, I know all these people, so I'll make intros for you. So it's that kind of thing. You know, like, working with others who you already know and kind of maybe leaning on each other in a sense. Yeah. Um, and, and to be clear, offline, there are some agencies who do it also. Um, and it's nice because as an agency, they'll just take 
an extra cut. So they'll take a CPM um, on the inserts that go out. So, yeah. you know, that's an option. Yeah, thanks for that. That's really interesting. And it's a way that you can get in front of more of similar buyers and um, <clears throat> without spending, you know, ad spend, essentially. And you even talk yeah. about... I mean, you have these list of buyers. Some people will actually sell the list. Oh yeah, to people. Yeah, so so that's a, a huge way to get extra revenue, especially like, um, I mean, I love this because like all you do is you'll send the list over. Um, so so basically, they're list brokers and their companies who will do this for you, and it's a very secure process. Like, you know, no one's stealing your data or whatever. Um, and and you'll send them lists, and you'll just get paid every time someone rents your list. So like. I mean, it's not a huge money maker, but the fact is, like, you're gonna send people a file which might take you like 20 minutes, um, and then next thing you know, you know, you're making 10, 15, 20k a month in revenue right. for for sending one email. Um, so that kind of stuff, it's what people don't realize. Um, and also, I think one thing that's funny to me is like, I think people think like I, I've had some clients who I worked with and like they don't want to do it, right? Why? They're like. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, to them, it was like, oh, well, like, I don't want to give up my data. Um, I get that to an, to an extent, but somebody already has your customers' data. Like Epsilon, Axiom, all these massive data companies, they have data on everybody, and and like, it's your your data is being sold anyway. So, like, I mean, yeah, like, I guess you can you can make you can make a big you know fuss about it. But no matter what happens, it's going to be done. That's how the world has worked for 40 years. And, and like you know, before Facebook and stuff, this was being done in direct mail since 1980. You know, like this has been going on forever. So like, um, maybe it's not like pub, um, you know, politically correct to say, but our data is being sold. So if you want to not have the revenue from that, that's fine. But someone else is going to do it anyway. <laughs> is there a scarcity piece of that though? Like, well, I just want them buying my stuff and not someone's related products, or is it less, less that? So, so yes, but at the same time, so a lot of mailers they'll they'll basically ask to review everyone who rents their list first, and if the offer is too competitive, they can say no. So you, as a list owner, have that have that privilege to say, oh, okay, well, so and so wants to rent my list. Um, but we both had weight loss offers, so no, yeah, yeah not happening. I mean, here's the thing, though, is you know, my point is when you are looking for weight loss, you buy 10 different products. I mean, people who are looking oh, for, for weight sure. loss solutions, yeah. they buy everything anyways. So it's not saying if they buy this, they're not buying this, right? It, it, exactly, yeah. So it I, doesn't really yeah. matter. Exactly. I, I mean, the fact is if you don't have it, someone else will have it and they'll go there. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I always ask because it's in Spart Insider um, about the challenges, low points, tough times, and then on the flip side, some of the proud moments. What's been like a low point or tough time that you had to push through? Um, I think that uh, the one I mentioned in the beginning was one of the biggest ones. Like, I... I had dreamed about having my business successful for so long, and and, and that first year, I I must have worked. In, I, I had a full time job then too. I was working a full time job. I was coming home late at night. Um, I was trying so so hard to make it work, and I made nothing. Right? I, I told you, you know, I I, I had an SBA loan, I a twenty thousand dollar loan. I had like my other savings sunk into it, and I made no money for one full year. Like, why didn't you quit? You know why? Um, because I read books that made me realize that like I could do it, um, mm. and I think that's a, a, another concept like you know self development and continually making yourself better to make sure you can succeed. Because these challenges will come, and if your mind isn't on point, you're screwed. You're gonna give up and you're gonna mm. fail. Um, but like one book which I always talk about. I mean, everyone's read it, but uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, that book, uh, Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz, all these books which were so vital to my to my inner belief and, and my self confidence, right? That's what pushed me through. You know, mm. it wasn't it wasn't new strategies or tactics. It was my mindset that told me, you know what, I can do it. I had to just keep pushing through and not giving up. Um, yeah, yeah. So even that year 
full-time job, you pour in twenty or thirty thousand dollars, you make one sale for forty-five dollars. It was those that mindset, training your mindset to think it's not an if, it's a when type exactly. of situation. Exactly. Yep. Was there anything else that helped? Because books help, but I don't know. You know, there's only so much you can lean on in a book. Is there something well, that you like other people or, or something else that you leaned on? Um, you, you know, at the time there wasn't really, it wasn't people because, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's people now. So these days, like, I mean, there are still challenges in my business. So now it's people because I've learned that. Back then I was like trying to do it all myself. And it was just so, just so horrible. But one thing that helped me was um, I also, so that, that previous year, that's when I lost all that weight, right? And like, I would say, at least maybe not right now, but back in that time, that was my biggest like life challenge. Like I'd struggle with my weight my entire life. Mm. So to to realize that, holy crap, like I can do this. I just lost 75 freaking pounds, like after trying for 15 years, right? Um, I think that also, you know, kind of put It gave you confidence. Yeah, this like unwavering sense of belief that I can do things, mm. you know? Yeah, so someone could take just some unwavering sense of belief in one aspect and then translate it to another portion. Um what turned the corner for you with the weight loss after you had been trying for so long? Besides you know, um, your supplement, and they should go buy 10 bottles of it. No, I'm just oh, kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was, uh, well, it was two things. One was, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss' book, The 4-Hour Body? Sure. Uh, that helped, or, or not, not for about the 4-Hour Work Week, where we had like, actually, it might have been The 4-Hour Body, whatever. It was like some blog post that talked about his slow-carb diet. So I followed the slow-carb diet. And like that's that was the first time I, mm. like, I lost like ten pounds in two mm. weeks. I was like, holy crap! Like this has never happened in my life, right? So I kept following that diet and I kept working out and taking supplements and doing this stuff for a long time. And um, obviously, I, I had challenges here and there. Like I got off slow carb. I tried other stuff, um, but that was the first thing that kind of kicked things off and got me mm-hmm. going. Um, and after that, it was like, look, if I can lose ten pounds in two weeks after trying for for 15 years i can keep at this and succeed um so yeah just kept pushing it through so is a slow carb like a intermittent fasting or is it more like a paleo type of yeah it, it's more paleo so basically it's yeah. like uh it's like you eat like your only carbs are beans and vegetables yeah um and then you eat like you know chicken and got like it beef and so stuff. it's cutting out all the dairy and white yeah, sugar they, white flour type of Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Bad carbs. Exactly. Gotcha. So it, it, it's basically low carb with your carb as being beans and veggies. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever think about just giving up at any point during that time? Yeah. Yeah, I I did. Um, you know, there was another time which was after that. So so this is when the business was doing well or, or started doing well, right? So we had like we had some big affiliates promoting us and like. You know, we're make, making like eight thousand dollars in a day, just like just like killing it in terms of sales. But I had no systems in place, right? Mm. So I come back from my day job. I'm working all night long. It's like five a.m. and I and and I'm packaging up bottles, putting them into the package, driving to the post office. There's no one in the streets. No one's awake. No one's around. It's just me. And I'm like, this sucks. Like I have a business, but I have no life. I have no control over anything. I, like I have to go to work in two hours like this sucks like you know um right. so again yeah it was that I just like I felt so bad for myself and the reality is like I didn't take the time um to put the systems in place to yeah. scale you know yeah. so yeah we were talking before we started <laughs> recording is now you know you're going to India Morocco Spain all these places I'm like yeah. I need to be you know people say be like Mike I might be like Sam you know um <laughs> At what point did you decide to quit the job? Uh, about four years in, mm. so took took some time, yeah. Um, but but it was nice. So it was by that time, I, I really had like system. Actually, no, it was, it was five years. So I worked for, I basically worked for five years in finance, um, and then uh, yeah. So and I left, and I've been, been doing my stuff full time. Although I, I've had some clients, like, like one was Martha, who I I spent forty hours a week on, on just on her stuff. So like it was almost a full-time job in and of itself um but yeah so i mean there was a lot of 
still a lot of work involved. So like, yeah, I wasn't working a full time job the last few years, but I was, I was basically. You have a lot of balls that you're <laughs> juggling. Yeah. 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 Um, and you said a key thing about systems. You had to put systems in place. What are some key systems that you put in place that have been so important? And it could be a software. It could be something else. Yeah. So um, I'd say the biggest thing is really just connect. Yeah. So connecting. We have AltraCart. We have ClickFunnels. We have all the different s- softwares. We have them connected with uh, Veracore and other 3PL systems to basically transmit orders directly to fulfillment and having the warehouse handle everything. Because before, like, I mean, I, was, I, I just didn't know what I was doing. Like, I, I had bottles that were in my garage and stuff. Like, I just, like, I, I was doing this with no really, no no process in place. But then I, when I moved to having warehouses in place and really having everything super automated, having everything done by somebody else, and then having my customer service teams that I hire internally to do email and telephone and all these things, like, everything is handled, right? So, right. like... I'm not doing 95 things. I'm doing like four things really well. Yeah. You know? so. um, I know you have another call now. So yes. <laughs> everyone should check out sarkmediadirect.com slash eight dash figures. It, it shares some of these concepts. And um, San, I just want to thank you. This was fantastic. Thank you, man. Great yeah. talking to you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Came out better on the other side See, life's like a peach if you find the sand And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand